If you have been following the lecture series uh, that we have been having recently, Introduction to Finite Element, I know you are familiar with the different type of finite elements, the beam element, and when we talk of the spring element. And if you've been together with us uh, for the past two months, where we have talked about seven lessons, you might have heard about the beam element. And you have seen this example in one of our lessons. This is lesson five. You can watch it on the link above there. We give this as a practice to the student. You're given a beam that uh, it have got uh, on one edge here. It's give, uh, it, it have a spring element. Uh, springs typically here could be used to model uh, the sinking support. And then you are required to determine the deflection, rotation, and the reaction forces using, of course, the matrix method or the finite element analysis. And we give this as a typical solution, but we never solved the problem because it was a practice. So I hope now you have done your practice and uh, now you're going to see the steps. You can now check yourself whether you really obtain or you're able to, to move ahead with the steps that were learned later on. So let's dive in. My name is Dr. Naftari Gathemba with another tutorial. If you have never subscribed to this channel, kindly consider subscribing and uh, let's continue together in this uh, education platform. All right, this is our problem. We've been given the element, they have been numbered. Even if they were not numbered, we said one of the criteria is that uh, loads are applied at the node. So where load application, we have a node there. Then at the support, of course, that's a node because there'll be, even though it's not directly applied load, there is a reaction. So reaction is like kind of a, a force acting or a load acting there. So we that one you can take it as a node. So there's a node that one, this fixed head, where we have um, a pin spot and then at the end here. And again, now you can see we have two beam element and one spring element. And if you can look carefully, you can see the load applied on the spring is on the direction. For the beam element, you consider the transverse loading. So the loading is applied or acting in the same, in the same direction. So in, when it comes to assembly, this simplifies everything. I hope you can open your eyes and see that. What would happen if the spring was not oriented in that direction, right? Think about that as we continue. Now, uh, the first step is, of course, to get the elemental stiffness matrix. and. Um, for the three elements we know for, for the beam. K, okay, this formula, I hope you remember, I gave a simple uh, strategy of remembering things. So, though I, in, a, in, a, in an exam setup, I do not expect you to be tested on this. Uh, I mean, to be tested on the remembering of this it should be given, but I, you can you can just get uh, your own method of trying to remember this. I said you can partition this into four parts. So what you just need to recall, this is the same, the, the only difference is on this element, this one. And this one. So here, this is four, four, and then this is two, two. So you see, once you know that, you're just going to know that uh, 12, 6, L, uh, 6, L, 4, L squared. When you come here, you move across the low, the columns have got negative. When you move down one, uh, across, across, like, I mean, down the row, this is negative. And then when you move from this diagonal to this diagonal, I mean, along the main diagonal, you put on the minor diagonal, the negative signs. Anyway. That's not a test here. So of course, K1 and K2 are the same uh, because uh, it's just a beam element. The only thing that you need to note here is that here, uh, and I've indicated here, the node number one to so the degrees of freedom. Remember the beam have got two degrees of freedom at each node. So you have um, V1 or vertical displacement at node one and uh, rotation at node one. The same case V2, theta two. Uh, here we have uh, V3, theta three, but four because it's a spring, there is only V4 axial displacement. Remember the spring can only carry axial loads or no rotation. So only V4 here, right? As you can see, we said you can just add up global stiffness matrix. The road is applying this in the same direction. So you can just uh, do the, what you call the spur position. So first we talk spur imposing one on the other, uh, the, the beams elements, K1 and K2. By spur position, you just look at the common node. The compatibility condition enables us now to know that node two is shared and the nodes remain connected. So only submission will be at node two. So V2 theta two, when you count to V3, this is V2 theta two. So this is V2 theta two. So only this and this are going to be added up. So you see where you have V2 theta two, uh, V2 theta two, this component is the only one we are adding. 12 plus 12, 24. Minus six L plus six L zero minus six L plus six L zero and uh, four L squared plus four L squared eight L squared. From there now, this one you just it's like you're imposing one on the other, shifting the two matrices, and then you get obtain that. So this is the stiffness matrix of the beam element, uh, the combination of these two. And of course, now when you add this part, eh, you have the equation. But remember, this is not a well, so that's why I said that. Uh, this part may be uh, don't be misled. Then what we need to do is now we need to incorporate for the spring. Now the spring, this is um, node 3, 4, and we have V3, 
V4. I mean, axial deformation are the only uh, degrees of freedom for the spring element, right? So where you have V3, and then we need to introduce V4. Remember, we do not have theta four, okay? So we need to argument or expand our matrix to incorporate that. And um, as you remember, K for the spring is equal to K minus K minus K, K. And then this would be V3, V4. You see there are no thetas, right? Eh? Yeah, K minus K minus K, K. And therefore, just need to come now to our global equation, a global Stevens matrix for the beams, and then we introduce the spring. Eh? So where you have V3 and V4, this is where we are adding K minus K. Remember this symmetrical. So this is the same one you had the previous one. So to reduce the workload, remember we, we observed that uh, one of the characteristic of the stiffness matrix is that it's symmetrical. So you see whatever is on this side is on this side. This is a uh, minus six L and then uh, this is uh, 4L, K, 0, this is 0, then this is minus K, prime. So why prime? We are using the prime here because remember we have this quantity here, EI of L cubed, but this K doesn't have. But again, we want to simplify our working. So we define a new quantity K prime to be L cubed, the reciprocal of this so that they will cancel, and then you just add it here. So it's only our matrix that we had for the beams. Then here you have V3, V4, you add this component, eh? this component of K. And that should be the global stiffness matrix. Eh? And now to get the equation, the global stiffness equation, you just need to, to bring in uh, the uh, displacement component, the, the degrees of freedom, and also the force uh, or the applied load uh, vector, right? And we know at node one, we will have both the vertical of the reaction as well as the moment, F1, M1. In the same case, F2, M2 in this node, these are being F3, M3, but F4 here, note that we do not have rotation it's just a spring so uh, theta 4 is equal to 0 is not considered there that's why this matrix you see if it was just another like continuous bar here it'd have a uh, how many nodes one two three four eight by eight but you can see this is a seven by seven matrix because now here degree of freedom is just one right Ah, good. Now our work is simplified. So the test was on how to handle this uh, spring. Now from there, you just go ahead uh, with our typical method of solving this. So what you need to do to apply here is the boundary condition so that you can get the reduced stiffness, uh, reduced equation, finite element equation. And um, to do this, you just are uh, observing this. Eh? Just need to look at your matrix here, and then you look at the, the support conditions. This is a fixed end, so so this end, this is fixed. So v1 theta one is equal to zero. We do not expect any rotation here. Again here, okay, this is hinged, so rotation is unsuspected, but uh, no vertical movement. So v2 is equal to zero. Again, uh, v4 is fixed, is equals to zero. V3, of course, this uh, is kind of country, huh? can deliver that, but with a spring. So spring bring a jacking action, but so we know the node can move up and down. So those are the boundary condition. And again, uh, we are given the load P applied at node three and downwards. So remember the sign convention for the uh, FEM analysis. So it will be F3 in the Y direction is equal to negative because it's acting downwards. So that's just all you need to apply. These are the boundary condition V1, theta one, V2, V4, or zero. Uh, again, uh, because of the support condition, this is free, M3 of course is zero, and this is uh, hinged, so no no, no moment will develop here. But here, of course, because it's a fixed end and it's built in this support, we'll have a moment developing here. And again, as I stated, F3Y is equal to negative. What you need to do now is just reduce this equation and uh, simply uh, just disregard or just cancel temporarily. It's not that you are throwing them away, but temporarily, whatever I've got uh, zero degree of freedom corresponding rows and columns corresponding to uh, quantities, the, the degree of freedom is zero uh, values. Eh? So V1, theta one, V2, theta two. So V1, you remove that column and this associated row, right? The same case. So you see V1, theta one, that will go, V2 will go and uh, v4 will go so we'll be left with uh theta 2 v3 theta 3 so you see all that goes there yeah, that goes so two goes and again four goes so basically you are left with this part and remember it's symmetric so this would be minus six l then uh, this would be minus six l and then this would be two l squared and then uh, these are the degree of room theta 2 v3 theta 3 m2 f3y m3 so that's a uh, reduced uh, equation that you are going to be left with so this is what is given now the other step is to determine the node of uh, degree of freedom the quantities that are required which is theta theta 2 
So theta two v three theta three. So you just need to solve this. This you can solve by by row reduction because you have three degrees of unknown. So I would not advise you to use uh, the the grammar through here. By row reduction, it's very easy. Uh, by making one the subject and replacing, so you you have you are going to get what is theta two, what is v three, what is theta three, right? And they are given like this. And again, remember you are given the quantity of p. Because now you have expressed in terms of P, L's, and K prime. Eh? So K already, you know K prime is, uh, we define a new quantity, which was K. Uh, and then we, the reciprocal, this reciprocal here, L cubed di. So you're just now going to substitute these values given here, this, and you get your answer. Very easy. Eh? These are the answer, the degrees of freedom. So what the next step, just need to get the reactions. The reaction, now you have to go back to the overall equation that you had. You had the overall equation. So the reactions on this end now we have the F1, Y, M1, the forces and the moment at each of the nodes. So like for, if we take a typical example of F1, Y, you need to use the first row together for the first equation. Eh? So what is this? Remember, you can see there are a lot of zeros here. And, and again, uh, remember the quantity is given. So V1, theta 1, V2, V, V4 is equals to zero. So V1, this is already zero. So this is zero. So 12 times zero, that is gone. Uh, again, the theta one is gone, V2. So even this one, the equation becomes very simple here. Uh, V2 times, uh, uh, even V2 is zero. So theta two, so theta two is not equals to zero. We have calculated that theta two is given here. So theta two times, uh, so theta two quantity corresponding is, 6L times theta 2 plus V3. Ah, now the other quantities, all well, these are zeros. So it's like that time, even if you multiply by this, it should be zero. So it means F1Y is equals to 6L theta 2, which is 6 times uh, L. Of course, uh, L is 3 times theta 2. Remember, there is this quantity EI of L cubed. Don't forget this one. So if you substitute these values here, E is given to 10 GPA, not the unit. GPA, that is uh, times 10 to power 6 uh, Newton per meter squared. So take care of consistency of the units. And if you substitute that, so here you're going to have 6 times uh, 210, 6 EI L times 10 to power 6 times uh, i, this is 2, times 10 to power minus 4, then uh, times minus 0 0.00, this one, 24.92. This one you divide by 3 squared y squared. It was cubed, but there was an L here. So this L and, and, and one L, and so this way squared. So if you act this one out, you are about to get uh, around 69, I believe. So this is for F1. Same case for M1, you take the second row, you're going to get that. So you work them out and it becomes uh, it's very easy. So you're going to get typical answers. F1 was 69.78 negative, M1 like that, F2i and F4i. And that was all what was being tested here in this example. So let me know whether there is any where you felt stuck. I believe I've given enough uh, tutorials and examples on this kind of beams and finite element analysis. So let me know in the comment section, what would, what do you think would have happened if, for example, this uh, spring was in a crowd at an angle or even applied in this direction? Would you still have added directly like that? Or do you think there would have been any change because of the orientation of the spring? Let me know in the comment section and any other question that you may be having. Thank you for your patronage. Until the next episode, bye-bye for now.